Hey, pushers. So change of plans. As of March 20th, AP has just announced that there will be a uh, online version of the AP exam. My understanding as of now, and I'll keep you updated, is that it will be um, available for you to take on a computer, a smartphone, or um, an iPad. Uh, it will only be a 45-minute test. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, I'm worried, but that's okay. We're all going to be fine. Um, it will only cover periods one through seven. So good news, we finished the content. So I'm going to be starting the review videos. AP says that they will also be putting up review vi videos starting on the 25th. So that's five days from now. But we're going to go ahead and get started on our more intensive review. So as of now, I don't know um, how many multiple choice. I don't know um, about DBQ, short answers, or long essays. I don't know any of this. Um, as soon as I find out, as soon as AP tells me, I will let you guys know. So as of now, we're preparing for an online 45-minute AP U.S. History exam. Uh, and the, and uh, covering the exam, the exam will be periods one through seven. So here is part one of the review for period one. So our big themes here are going to be, essentially, uh, what were the effects of the encounters between Europeans and indigenous populations in the Americas? So we're gonna look at the pre-Columbian Atlantic world. So not only the pre-Columbian North America, but we're also gonna look at the pre-Columbian Europe. And then we're gonna look at how they encountered each other. So we're going to go through um, in this particular review. If you want to follow along with the frame, it will align. We should have two frames um, for this uh, PowerPoint, um, but I'm going to be breaking it up into 20 minute videos. All right, we're going to start with the uh, pre-Columbian societies of the New World, of the Americas. And the defining characteristic of the Southeast, the Northeast, the Great Plains, the Great Basin, the Southwest, and the Plateau regions of North America is that these very diverse, very indigenous Native societies, they adapted to and transformed their environments through innovation in agriculture, resource, and social structure. So they're going to adapt to and change, transform their environments. So we're going to start in the, the east. So we're going to be looking at the green and then the purple parts of North America here. One of the defining characteristics of both the Northeast and the, Nor and the Southeastern tribes was that they were mound builders. They tended to build these earthen uh, mounds for various reasons. At first, scientists thought that these were strictly for religious reasons, but now we know they are for both religious as well as practical regions. So you can kind of see some of these mounds. Sometimes they're uh, pyramid shaped, sometimes they're bird shaped, and like this picture right here, sometimes snake shaped. So they are just as diverse as the societies that created them. Because of the amount of time and effort they put into these, uh, these societies, particularly in the Southeast, are going to be more permanent societies. Um, this is a, actually an example of a UNESCO site in northern Louisiana called Poverty Point. And as you can see, they did build these dams. Um, and uh, they were used essentially as earthen mounds. And they would place their... Um, living structures on top because as we know louisiana tends to be a little swampy so these mounds tended to be more practical but also in poverty point they had bird shaped mounds like this one right here in the schematic all right so now let's drill down into the eastern woodland so this is going to be the northeastern tribes right the northeastern tribes so this is going to be that green area that we see here it's going to embrace the mississippi river as well as the atlantic coast these tribes had the greatest amount of resources for food, so they tended to be a little more lackadaisical because supplies and resources were so easy for them. As a result, they're going to have mixed agriculture, where they have simultaneous fishing, hunting, gathering, farming. Farming to the place of three sister farming, maize, beans, squash. And because of all this abundance of natural resources that um, is a uh, characteristic of the northeastern woodland tribes, they tended to favor semi-permanent settlements. 
So instead of constantly uh, trying to keep farmland viable, uh, what they would do is they would just shift it around. They would move it, their farmland around. So they would often have summer homes, winter homes, and then they would crop rotate. So sometimes farming would be in location A, sometimes farming would be in location B. Again, there was an abundance of natural resources, so they could move their farmland around. The eastern woodlands also tended to be matriarchal, where women did the farming, with the exception of tobacco. Um, they engaged in often slash and burn agriculture, so uh, they would um, burn down farm fields to enrich it and fertilize it, leave it fallow, and then farm in another field until this field was uh, available to farm on. So they did have permanent and semi-permanent settlements. Um, so, like I said, they tend to be a little bit more mobile. Natives, uh, you know, didn't have the desire, nor did they even have to manipulate nature aggressively. So they just simply moved on to more fertile land once exhausted. Two uh, tribes that are associated with the eastern, northeastern woodland tribes are the Iroquois Confederacy, which is in what is today uh, the state of New York. They often lived in longhouses. And then the Algonquin-speaking people. This was a language group around the Great Lakes. Now let's move um, from the uh, green region to now the purple region, this area that is in the southern eastern um, United States. So these were more substantially permanent settlements with uh, large trading networks. Um, and this was because of their access to the Mississippi and the Mississippi's tributaries. So they would be able to trade um, a little more extensively. Um, and they, their cultures were also based on corn and other types of grains grown in the fertile Mississippi River Valley. Um, they also tended to build earthen and temple mounds. Uh, they had very advanced farming systems like, uh, you know, irrigation and that kind of thing. Um, and so the Mississippi River was a big part of these southeastern tribes. Um, and they did uh, have uh, advanced tools, um, iron implements, um, as well as uh, they were very advanced in woven fa fabrics using plant matter. Um, and they did have um, burial mounds as well, much like we see with the Egyptians. So uh, this an example of a Southeastern tribe um, that had an extensive uh, trade network with a cahokia near what is modern day St. Louis in Missouri. Um, and they had uh, a very advanced society, one of the most advanced society um, in uh, North America. And so they built these temple mounds, um, like you see here, very similar to what we saw in, um, in Mexico with the Aztecs and the Incas. Uh, again, um, the, the corn farming was a big part of those uh, Mexican societies, and that corn farming was brought up into the American Southeast right and also led to these permanent settlements so again um now let's move from the east let's go west so the western tribes i'm going to uh, really focus here on the southwestern tribes so these are the pueblo indians and again much like we saw in our southeastern tribes um the corn cultivation was a big part moving from what was today mexico up into the american southwest and so they also engaged in three sister farming, maize, beans, squash, um, and they're going to have advanced economic uh, systems, advanced irrigation systems, and as a result, they're, they're very socially diversified. So they were farmers and there are uh, leaders, so they, they had a hierarchical system. All right, um, because the Southwest is drier than areas in the East, irrigation is gonna be particularly advanced in the South Southwestern tribes. And because they're building these irrigation systems, they also tended to have more substantial, more permanent settlements. If you're gonna go through the trouble of building these irrigation systems, they tended to be um, much more settled, much more, um, permanent. So substantial towns grew, town centers, uh, trade centers started to sprout out in the southwest. Here are some examples of irrigation systems um, and an ancient society 
that was very advanced was the Anasazi. They built these adobe buildings, again, much more permanent because if you're building irrigation systems, you're going to want to have a permanent settlement. Another example of this are gonna be the, uh, the Navajo. Okay, um, and now we're gonna move to the Northwest. So the Northwest, this is right here, this light colored purple, the California region. Um, they tended also to be uh, rich in natural resources, not quite as much as we see in the Northeast, but there are some. So because of the Pacific, um, they also engaged in fishing. Now, as we all know, the terrain of the um, Pacific is very mountainous. And then there's a sheer cliff that drops down to the beach. So territory, access to the beach, access to the water, this territory tended to be um, very competitive. And, uh, and so violent competition characterized the um, Pacific Northwestern tribes. They also lived in substantial permanent settlements along the coast. Again, when they claimed valuable territory, they, they tended to stay there in long houses with as many as 50 people in each house. Here is an example of a long house and fishing of the Pacific Northwest. Again, the long house. All right, next up, let's go a little further uh, south from the Pacific Northwest into the Great Basin and this area right here, which is considered to be uh, the grasslands of the Western Great Plains. So this area right here, um, dry, that is what characterizes this. Um, and as a result of the, the terrain um, and the climate being very dry, we see that these tribes tend to be more nomadic, mobile lifestyles. They often tended to hunt big game. So they were big game hun hunters. If you were farther up to the north, it was like um, uh, moose and caribou and elk. A little further south, it's going to be the buffalo. So here you see the teepees and the various other types of a more mobile Great Basin and Western Great Plains societies. All right. Um, like we said, the Great Basin was dry, so it lacked natural resources. So it's going to be more nomadic. We've already said this. Um, the buffalo being in the south, and then the further up north is the moose and the caribou. Um, and they chase the game. Uh, one of the big things that's going to come out of encounters with Europeans is the reintroduction of the horse by the Spanish. And this is going to greatly increase uh, native cultures in here, uh, in the Great Basin and the Great Plains, um, to be much more nomadic. All righty. So let's go to the Great Plains. So the Great Plains um, are gonna be not quite as dry. Um, they're about right here. So there are choices. Um, if you have access to a river, some of these natives tended to have uh, some irrigated farming, um, but with the reintroduction of the horse, farming's hard. So they, they switched over to um, nomadic lifestyles chasing the game. So that's what we largely see in the Great Plains, the Sioux and the Pawnee being examples. So farming until the horse was reintroduced. Um, and uh, there's a lot of buffalo here. Grasslands led to game, big game hunting. And this is going to be the tribes that are going to be, uh, that are going to lose agency in the late 1800s in the Great Plains Wars. All righty. So let's now go to Europe. So we go from pre-Columbian North American societies to pre-Columbian uh, European societies. So um, again, all of this being the Atlantic world. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to see is that pre-Columbian, um, Europe was very provincial. It was very local. It was largely uninterested in any place outside of itself. Uh, and we're picking up the story with that in the Middle Ages. And as we saw in the Middle Ages from 500 to 1500 AD, um, this was largely an agriculturally based society, subsistence agriculture. Uh, and under this economic system known as feudalism, we'll see that it's very hierarchical, you know, kings at the top, then lords, then knights, then, um, then basically serfs, the people, the 99% that tended to be the farmers. Um, and they farmed the land, gave portions to the kingdom. The kingdom provided 
uh, the serfs protection because as we all see here in this European map, uh, fighting for territory uh, was a big part of European um, pre-Columbian societies, all the various uh, tribes at war with each other for territory. But then an event took place that killed about 60% of the European population, and that was the Black Plague. So the Black Plague um, is going to reduce population numbers significantly. But by the 1500s, the populations will recover, um, and we experience a population growth. And as a result of a population growth, the price, the, the rise of land value, because with a lot of people, little bit of land, the value of the land goes up. Agricultural prices also go up because um, more people and the land is finite. So in order to, um, as we start to see uh, the rise of, um, of commerce, right, more people, more commerce, uh, resurgence in commerce, this is going to lead to uh, the accumulation of wealth by individuals, by specific individuals, those engaged in commerce. These are the merchants. So we're starting to see a shift away from the economic structure known as feudalism and now towards capitalism, right, where we buy and sell products. And we're going to want to get those products, those cool Asian products. So we're going to see an advancement in shipping and navigation. All right, so with the rise of commerce, with um, all these and populations, all of these various territories start to become what are known as nation states. Um, these, what used to be kings and queens, fighting with each other over territory. And these governments were, uh, were more powerful than the weak feudalistic structures that were held together by the Pope and the Roman Empire. Um, in the Middle Ages, but now we're starting to see emerging from this the rise of nation states. So the rise of the state of England, the rise of the state of France, the rise of the state of Spain, right? Um, and instead, stronger monarchs are going to emerge and want to seek wealth in order to build up their militaries, in order to fight, in order to gain more territory. So with this increasing organization and complexity, tax structures are starting to emerge. All right, so in order to get to those cool Asian products, we are seeing a drive towards Asia. Now, historically, um, Europe did have access to Asia, but through uh, the Silk Roads. These were roads that extended from Europe largely into North Africa and the Middle East and into Asia. You all have heard of Marco Polo. But here's the problem. These Muslim traders right, got savvy, and so they started charging tolls for merchants to access these trade roads going to Asia. So the desire now was to find a water access um, in order to, uh, to, for Europe to get to Asia. All right, in order to have water access, we need to have improvements in technology, in sailing technology. So um, some examples of some innovations in uh, maritime technology includes the sextant, the astrolab, um, more accurate maps, and mariner's compass. And so the whole point was to, again, find a safer sea route to Asia. All right, one of the first to begin this process were the Portuguese, uh, Prince Henry the Navigator with his modern ship known as the Caravelle. And this Caravelle ship uh, could essentially use a sail system to tack in order to go against um, winds and actually use winds to go in any direction that they want. So we're going to see these technologies are going to make it so that we can try and circumnavigate around the African continent in order to try and gain access uh, to Asia. All right, first, the Portuguese are going to hug along the African coast and establish colonies along the African coast. Um, and one of those explorers, Portuguese explorers, was Bartolomeu Diaz. He sailed around the southern tip of Africa, extending Portugal's interests to not just the west coast of Africa, that was Prince Henry, but to the east coast of Africa, that's Diaz. And once we get to the east coast of Africa, establishing ports along the way to stop and refuel, we can then have access to India and Asia. 
So um, Spanish exploration was was really to explore for wealth, wealth in terms of accessing Asian products. Um, uh, that was the Portuguese, rather. Um, so now what we want to do is other European countries are saying, hey, that's a great idea. Maybe we should start doing that too. So the second to get involved in this are going to be the Spanish. So uh, Spain was experiencing uh, a merging of various nation states, um, the nation state of Aragon and the nation state of Castile. These were two provinces within the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and uh, Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile are going to marry and um, will successfully see the expulsion of the Muslim Moroccan Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula. And this is known as this expulsion of the Moors out going back to um, Africa. Uh, it's called a Reconquista. And the idea for Spain now was to ban Islam and to spread Catholicism. And as we all know, that's the Crusades, part of the Crusades. All right, so the Portuguese, um, unfortunately, have control of the African uh, continent. So we can't really go around to Africa. So Christopher Columbus uh, suggested to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella that perhaps in order to reach Asia, we should go west. So this is a crazy plan, but um, the king and queen agreed. And so Columbus set sail October 12th, 1492. Um, and yes, uh, they didn't exactly get to, to Asia. As you can see here, um, going west, there was a big old continent in the way. Um, but there are natural resources and cool Native American products here that are going to be all the rage. So explorations of the New World, right? Um, both North and South America took place between the Spanish and the Portuguese. And yes, there was conflict between these Europeans. Finally, the Pope has to get involved and he draws a line down the Americas. It's known as the Treaty of Tordesillas or the Line of Demarcation, saying anything East of the line belongs to the Portuguese. Anything west belongs to the Spanish. All right, so the Spanish uh, are going to boost up their um, explorations of their portion of the Americas. And we see the conquistadors in search of gold, God, and glory. Um, and we have a series of Spanish explorers exploring what will become South America and North America. And you can see that here. All right, let's pick up the story um, because this is going to be the beginning of the end of the story with King Philip of Spain. So um, he is going to spend most of the acquired wealth that they discover, particularly in South America, gold and silver, um, with religious wars in Europe and North Africa. And as a result, their explorations of the Americas begins to weaken because all their efforts are being diverted back to Europe and North Africa. And this is going to open the door for other European, other European nations like the Dutch, the French, and eventually the English. All right, but before we move to the Dutch, the French, and the English, let's just um, kind of talk about, uh, let's go ahead and end here, actually. We'll start with the Spanish, the French, and the Dutch next video.